You may be seated. Well, we have just had Veterans Day, and since the Bible is filled with Scripture that has to do with warfare, with fighting, with battles, some of these battles being physical, that God had his, uh, the children of Israel to engage in, and some battles being spiritual, that is, we fight against the forces of darkness. But the Bible is filled with warfare from one end to the other. Uh, you're not very far into the book of Genesis before we see a religious dispute between two brothers that results in death. And then we go all through the Word of God, and there are battles that God has uh, blessed and, and, and said, go fight. He told His people to go fight. And then we come to the last book, the book of Revelation, and the last few chapters end in a great battle, the battle of Armageddon. So the Bible is filled with conflict and warfare because that is the reality in which we are in. It's because of sin. It's because of rebellion that this world is such a place of conflict. Now, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, we find that the Apostle Paul is talking to his son in the faith, his protege, Timothy, a pastor uh, of the city of Ephesus in that church. And among other things, he gives him this exhortation. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life, whereunto thou art also called, and hast professed a good profession before many witnesses. Dear Father, I pray that you would help us to understand today that we are in a warfare, that we are to be warriors, that we are to fight the good fight, but Lord, to do so in the way that you would have us to do. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Now some may see it as a strange thing for the Bible to refer to a fight that we ought to fight. After all, we associate fight, fighting with doing wrong. Uh, when I was a little boy, uh, my parents would try to tell me, don't fight, don't get into fights, that's wrong. Uh, and they were also wise to say that if you find yourself in a fight, it's okay to win it. <laughs> and so they gave me that sage advice because they knew that there would be times and it would be unavoidable. You would have to fight to defend yourself. And so there, but fighting is a negative thing. We, we think of it in those terms. And when we do it after the flesh, of course, it is a negative thing. But what we're talking about here is fighting the good fight, fighting the good fight, not a fight that is of the flesh, not a fight that is because you're angry or because you're, uh, you, you know, even that you want to establish dominance or something like that. Uh, this is the good fight of faith. Now, preachers and ministers and those who are called to preach and teach the Word of God are especially called to fight the good fight. But every believer, whether they are involved in ministry or not, if you have been saved, if you are following Christ, whether you realize it or not, or whether you're on the front lines or not, you're part of this battle. You're part of this fight. Even if it's those who watch the stuff, even if it's those who pray, those who, 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 who cheer, uh, you are part of this fight, uh, the good fight of faith. And every one of you in your, in your individual lives are going to have some battles. Uh, others may not even know anything about it. But listen, you're going to have a battle. You're going to have to fight in some kind of way or another. Now, this struggle is very old. It goes all the way back to the fall. It goes all the way back to Cain and Abel. And as we read the scriptures, we find those who were most faithfully serving God that many times they were called to do battle. Now, think of David. Now, David was not only one to fight the good fight, uh, he, he actually had to fight the good fight that was physical. God called a warrior. He called a warrior. And the first thing that we see from David is he was anointed to be king, and no sooner was he anointed to be king than he went into battle as a teenage boy, and he defeated a giant in combat. And he cut off his head, and he carried it around with him. Now, I've often thought about that. You know, that's a big head. Goliath had a big head. And I think David's just a stripling, as he was called, a youth, uh, perhaps a teenage boy. I'm putting him around 15, 16 years old, perhaps. And he cut that big head off with the giant's own sword. And then he tangled up his teenage fingers in, the, in its head, and he did this with it. 
And everybody cheered and roared, and then they had the battle engaged. Now, now listen, I want to I tell you something. God was in that. Well, it's a gory thing. It's a bloody thing. But this giant was blaspheming God Almighty. He was calling into question the existence and the, the, the holiness and the goodness of God Almighty. And David, who was one to worship God Almighty, couldn't stand to listen to what he said. And God gave him the physical ability to go in there and take him out. Now, by the way, there's much worse things that happened to Goliath after he died than what happened while he was alive. So let's understand that. But now, what am I getting at? We are in the New Testament now. And as much as sometimes preachers feel like I was born in the wrong dispensation, I would like to go Old Testament and I'd like to actually use a sword. That's not our weapon today. And while we have a sword in the graphic, it is symbolic it is symbolic. It represents the sword of the Word of God. The only weapon we have is truth. And it is pictured as a sharp two-edged sword in the spiritual sense because it goes into the heart and it does its work. But we do not use physical weapons in the church. That is not for us. But some of God's most faithful servants had to fight and had to fight some of them to the death. Now, we're to be lovers of peace. As Christians, we are called to peace. But we cannot have peace at the price of truth. We cannot have peace at the price of going along with false teaching and with godlessness. If we do, we're no longer leading others to Christ, but we are ourselves being led away from Him. If we stay with Christ, listen, if we stay with Christ, we're going to have to do battle. If we follow Christ, we are going to have opposition and we're going to have to resist that opposition. Again, not with carnal means, but we're talking about a spiritual battle. Now, there's a brand of Christianity today that is soft and mild and non-confrontational. And this brand of Christianity is part of the reason that the faith of Christ is losing ground in the West. It is the reason why Islam is making great strides. Because their very muscular and masculine faith makes Christianity look like something for wimps. We are so mild. We are so easy to push over. We are so easy to push around. And again, I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about Saying what's right, telling the truth, taking a stand in public for what's right. I think too many times preachers are afraid. There's a book I've ordered and I can't wait to read it. It's called Why Johnny Can't Preach. I don't know if you remember the book Why Johnny Can't Read. Well, this is Why Johnny Can't Preach. And it talks about the pressures that are put on ministers today uh, to go along, to get along, to, to make nice. Uh, because if you say everything that God would have us to say, and if you preach the Bible straight and true, then you're going to be unpopular, and you're going to be attacked, and you're going to be canceled. Well, that's what's been going on. But you know, this conflict isn't new, and we've got to take our stand in it. It's through conflict that God plans to build us up. It's through conflict that God intends to show the difference between truth and error, darkness and light, and, and we need to be able to take a stand. Now, we need to make sure of several things. First of all, that we don't fight against God. Now, when we do struggle with God, we sometimes, because we're human, because we are in the flesh, because we are carnal, we sometimes struggle at what God does. And some of the best people in the Bible had struggles with what God did. They'd ask God why. They didn't understand it. Job did it. David did it. You go through the Bible. And, and you may have had times when you struggled with what God was doing. You didn't understand it. Uh, sometimes there were, have been people who would, would struggle against God, like Jonah was told to go uh, to Nineveh, but instead he went the other way. And so he fought against God's will and went the other way, and we know how that turned out. So we don't fight against God. And you know, we're not to fight one another. As Christians, we're not to fight one another. We're to go to the Lord, and if we have a dispute, we're to take it to God. We're not enemies to each other. You know, even people of different denominations and people who may not do things just like we do or they may not dot their I's and cross their T's exactly like we Baptists do. Listen, they're not my enemies. If they're not against us, they're for us. Uh, Jesus said, leave them alone. He didn't say go over there and join with them and support their missionaries, but he said, just leave them alone. 
There, there are groups out there that I'm glad they're there. I'm glad they're doing what they're doing. If they're preaching the truth of God, if they're preaching the gospel, if people are getting saved and walking with Christ, I'm for it. I'm happy they're doing what they're doing. I may not be able to walk side by side with them in every way, but I'm certainly not, don't count them my enemies. Amen? We're brothers, even if we're not twin brothers. And so it is that we ought to not struggle against one another. There's two different kinds of struggles. One, there's the struggles that impose upon us uninvited or unexpectedly. There's battles that come to us. We didn't ask for them, but they just came. And then two, there's struggles that we initiate by design because we're supposed to. There's a principle involved. Now, let's understand before we get into our outline today, and I want to make it clear that all of our fights are spiritual battles. All of our battles are spiritual battles. They are in the arena of ideas. They are to be used with words. We use our words. Now, our enemies may use force. They may use incarceration. They may use physical injury. They may use economic punishments. They may even use uh, corporal punishments and even uh, uh, death. But we use words. That is what we do. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 3 through 5. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Now what that is saying is what we've been trying to make the point of here. Is that we live in this physical world, but our warfare is not a physical fight. We live in the flesh, but we do not war after the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, that is, they're not physical, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. That has to do with ideas, philosophies, thoughts, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you see clearly from the Word of God, our warfare is a spiritual Warfare. It is in the area of words. Now, let me ask you this. As a Christian, when you came to Christ, was it because somebody wrestled you down and beat you until you said, Be my Savior, Lord Jesus? Did somebody beat you up and make you become a Christian? No. What happened? You heard some words, or you read some words, you heard a message. That message affected you in your heart, and maybe it, it produced more discomfort in your heart than if you'd taken a physical beating. You know, some wrestlings we have spiritually hurt worse than a physical beating would. And so the idea is words came to you, and words talked to you, and words changed you. That is our battle. Now, what are our enemies? If we're in a battle, if we're in a warfare, what is our warfare? What is our battle? Well, we have three very old enemies, three very ancient foes, and here they are, the world, the flesh, and the devil. Now, let's understand who the enemies are not. It's not anybody here today. It's not me. It's not you. It's not that other group somewhere. We have three great enemies, the world, the flesh, and the devil. So let's talk about, first of all, struggles with this world system. Struggles with the world system. We must make up our minds as Christians that the world is not our friend. The world is not our friend. We have to know that right away. And so if we understand where we are, where we, where we are and where we exist as Christians, we left the world to come to Christ. And the growth that we have is to grow more in Christ and have less of the world in us and more of Christ in us because the world is not our friend. Now we live here, we make our money here, that's where we put our stuff. <laughs> but this world is not to live in our hearts. We have to live in this physical world. But this world is not our friend. This world crucified the Lord Jesus and would do it again if given the opportunity. We live here, but we need to limit how much of here we let into our hearts. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 puts it this way. Love not the world, 
Now, in the Bible, the word love has a great meaning. And in particular, the word love here has to do with choose. Choose not the world. Favor not the world. Uh, Look not at the world as the big thing. In other words, compared to Christ, the world is way out here somewhere on the side. Love not the world. Don't let the world be your focus. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, that is to prefer the world or choose the world over Christ, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, what's all in the world? Here it is. For all that is in the world. Uh, You want to know what's in the world? We're fixing to be told. The Bible is going to tell us what's in the world. Here it is. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. Now, I submit to you that that is a catch-all if there ever was one. That's what the world is all about. What makes me happy, what I like to look at, and who I like to become. It has to do with competition. It has to do with striving for dominance. It has to do with being the big shot. It has to do with personal pleasure, uh, regardless of what God's Word says or what is, is even common sense and decency. And so... The pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now the Bible says that what is valuable, and what is true, and what is good, and what lasts are those spiritual things. This world passes away. And you know, isn't that true? That's all that's in the world. That's what it is. What I want, what I want to see, and who I want to be. That's what the world is all about. Christians must make a choice. Whose side am I on? Because there is a conflict. And all we have to do is open our eyes to see it. There is a conflict out there. Men, don't be like the other men in this society. The other men in this society are not serving Christ. The the men of this world are lost. Christian men should stand taller be purer, live better, be wiser, work harder, love sacrificially, be men of God, let your light shine in this dark place, be balanced, be a grown-up, be a contributor, serve, give, sacrifice, provide, create, struggle like the man of God that He made you to be, don't follow, lead. Don't conform, challenge. Don't surrender, conquer. We are here to be light. We are here to be salt. We're not here to be jellyfish floating with the tide. We're here to be salmon swimming against the stream, swimming upstream if need be, uh, while the bears try to eat us. That's who we're called to be. We are uh, more noble creatures than a jellyfish that just has to float along with whatever's going. Women... Don't be like the women of this sin-sick society. You don't have to be like them. Be godly women. The women of this world are poisoned with bad advice and bad philosophy and bad goals. Be a woman for God. Shun the ungodly sinful persona that this world has popularized. Women can be great, but women can be great as women. They don't have to become great by imitating men especially when they imitate the darker and more unpleasant side of men. Let Jesus rule on the inside so His nature can be displayed on the outside. Be women of God. Don't be like the women of this world. Number two, struggles with the flesh. The world and the flesh and the devil struggles with the flesh. Now let's face it. This is our daily struggle. This is our continual struggle. I often think of Samson when it comes to this. The strongest man perhaps who ever lived. The kind of man who could lift up the city gates, pulling their posts up out of the ground and walk around. And not only that, but walk up a hill with it. Now that's, that's a man. You know, if I try to get one post out of the ground to repair a fence, I have to have a whole bunch of tools in four hours and sweat myself to death. Samson just goes there, picks it up, 
walks up the hill. He could kill dozens of Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. He was powerful. He was strong. But oh, how weak he was. His flesh got the best of him. And you think about David, the mighty warrior of God who we referenced a while ago. A man after God's own heart. A man who worshiped God. You read the Psalms and you you see a man whose heart is fixed on God. He's a, a godly man. And yet he sinned in a big way. And then we see Solomon with all his wisdom, with all his intellect, with all his intelligence, and yet uh, strange women led him away from God. And I've talked to men who, who think, well, I'm, I'm never going to do that. Well, then you're, you're stronger than Samson, more devoted than David, and wiser than Solomon. Don't think for a moment that you're not capable of sinning in the flesh. You are. But the flesh is, is a bigger thing than that basic idea of morality that we talk about. 1 Peter 2.11 says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. But there's more to fleshly lusts than those particular things that we often think about. Envy, hatred, pride, arrogance, uh, competition, all those things come to the flesh. All those things feed the ego. Our old nature cannot please God. We must override our old nature. Our old nature seeks satisfaction at the cost of righteousness. We must struggle against it to find righteousness and pursue it. Then it will be like Christ promised. He who loses his life shall gain it. If we understand that mortification of the flesh is not a downer, it's an upper. It's something that's good because it frees us for what God will bring us. You know what happens when we follow the flesh instead of the spirit? Uh, we, 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 uh, we trade filet mignon for spam. Listen, I've had Spam, and I've had filet mignon. And buddy, I like filet mignon a whole lot better, don't you? Now, I'll take Spam, and I'll eat it if I have to, but when I do, I'm thinking, boy, I can't wait till I can get me some filet mignon. Because it's better. The things God has for us is better. The flesh must be struggled against if we're to be happy, healthy, and successful. Struggle against the flesh. Listen, the, the Bible says the things that are inside you or what defile you, uh, the, the, the tendencies we have. You know what we've done in our country today? We have taken God off the throne, and we have put lust on the throne. Whatever somebody wants to do has become God today. Whatever somebody thinks would bring them pleasure has become God, and our entire uh, political structure, our academic structure, the arts Everything that we have in this society is leaning the way of self-fulfillment and every vile, perverse thing that people may come up with has become the new religion. If you don't believe it, just see what's going on in our schools today from kindergarten to college. Let me illustrate my point. What if I were to try to get a a bill passed and what if I were to try to get to, to convince society that uh, we ought to have in the library... Uh, we ought to have little children gathered together in the public library so that I, as a preacher, can tell them about Jesus Christ and tell them that how He is the Savior of the world and how He can forgive sin and how if you become a Christian, you can be successful in life and, and go to heaven when you die. Do you think they'd let me in? Do you think they'd give me one minute of their time to do that? But if I were a big 300-pound dude wearing women's lingerie, I could walk in there and teach these same kids about how cool it is to be a transvestite. And everybody claps. Now I'm illustrating this to prove a point. Do you think that I could go to the first grade class of our local public school and I could tell them that at least 20, maybe even 30% of the population are evangelical Christians and that we ought to lean that way. We ought to understand that they're good people and, and that we ought to uh, maybe follow them and listen to what they have to say. How far do you think I'd get with that? No, they wouldn't let me in there. Do you think we could get a bill passed in Congress? Uh, do you think that we could do something that advances the cause of Christ? What if I went to the Hollywood writers and I showed up and I had a, a seminar And I said, okay, all you Hollywood writers that write the scripts for the television shows on prime time and other places, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make one out of five of your characters an evangelical Christian, and I want you to portray them in the most positive light that you possibly can. 
and have everybody to recognize their value and their goodness and nod their heads about how good they are and say it's so cool that they're the way they are. And you're to do that for years until everybody agrees with that. How do you think that would go? Now, now, does it put in a different light when we look at it that way? Listen, we are facing the forces of darkness. Christianity is not winning in this culture. It is being rejected in this culture. And here we are. The Bible says to fight the good fight of faith. Well, when you're losing, what do you do? You don't throw up the white flag and say, I surrender. Here's what you do. You hold fast. You hold fast to the truth. Listen, Jesus never said we'd be in the majority. Let's wake up, America. Let's wake up American Christianity. We've had it nice a long time. We had a good run here in this country where for the most part, we were at least respected and maybe even preferred. There was a time when if you were to run for office in this country, you had to at least be a nominal Christian. You couldn't be an atheist. You couldn't be a non-Christian and get uh, elected. Now, try running for anything as an evangelical Christian and see how far you get. Uh, One that really believes the book. Now, what I'm saying is, listen, most of the countries of this world and most of the people who lived in the church age did not have anywhere near a majority and did not even have favor in the nations in which they lived. Go to China today, go to Vietnam, go to any of the Arab conglomerate countries and you will find Christians there who know that their society hates them, views them as a pariah, sees them as people who aren't even good citizens and yet they are growing by leaps and bounds and baptisms are increasing. We need to wake up and realize that we're not going to be successful at turning America around. I'm sorry. But we may be successful at turning our neighbor around or our son or daughter around, or our cousin around, or our friend around, or some visitor who comes in here sometime and looking for the truth, we may be able to do some of that. Listen, do you think that Jesus had the majority of people that loved him? No, they, they, they teamed up against him. The multitude said, crucify him. And the majority won. And when it came time to meet, there were about 120 that met. But listen, God blessed it and they grew and they had a wonderful run. Now, what am I getting at? We are going to struggle against the world, and we're going to struggle against the flesh. But we also are going to struggle against spiritual darkness. And the spiritual darkness is now ruling. They have the upper hand. They are in charge. They're the ones calling the shots. Where are the prisons that Christians have set up to put people in who aren't Christians. Scour the world and see if you'll find them. Where is the place in this world where a bunch of believers in Jesus Christ find someone who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ and thinks they're perhaps mentally ill and so they put them in an insane asylum and drug them until they believe in Jesus? Where does that happen? No, that's happened in other countries to Christians, but Christians have never done it. We know who's running the show because of who's making the decisions. Here's another tip for you. Who is it? Who is it that you dare not criticize? And who is it you can criticize with no repercussions? Today, you can criticize evangelical Christians all you want. And all society will do is smile at you and nod their heads in agreement. But there are certain aspects, there are certain things that if you raise up a critical note, if you point a finger and call it wrong, they will frown at you, they will throw something at you, and they'll find a way to make you an outlaw if they can. That's the world we're living in. Struggles against spiritual darkness is the devil and his agents. Ephesians 6.12. Ephesians 6.12, because this is the real battle. This is ultimately what it's all about. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now, what the Bible is saying here is our real fight is not with Washington, D.C. Our real fight are with the forces of darkness that are influencing and running Washington, D.C. Our real fight 
is not higher education and the professors and the administrators of these schools of ungodliness. Our real fight is the devil and his agents who have managed to take over an entire educational system to teach anti-Christian ideology and ungodliness. But it's the spiritual darkness behind it. Listen, my enemy is not that agnostic professor that is teaching our young adults that the Bible is a myth. He is a victim. Now, he's a perpetrator, but he's also a victim. He has been brought into darkness, and he is in darkness, and he is in chains, and he's putting other people in, in chains. The, the idea is we have an enemy today, and that ultimate enemy is Satan. Now, I'm not one of these that sees a demon under every rock or behind every tree. I know there are people who have tried to make a ministry out of throwing demons out of people. I don't know. Uh, there's been a time or two when I thought I really came across some demon-possessed person, but God didn't give me a gift to throw the demon out. I just made some distance <laughs> at a point between me and them. But I, I knew that something was dark there. Something was evil. Something was wicked. I have dealt with people who struggle with, uh, with darkness and with things of that nature and prayed with them, and I sensed that, that something was going on. I, I know it's real. But I'm not one to blame everything on a demon. Some ideas are just bad ideas. But I do know this. We don't want to under-recognize that either. Spiritual warfare is real. The forces of darkness are real. Jesus dealt with it. You remember the maniac of Gadara? What was wrong with that fellow? Well, I'll tell you what was wrong with the maniac of Gadara. He had a legion of demons inside of him. That's what was wrong with him. Jesus said so, and he talked to the demons, and he cast them out, and they went into the swine, and the swine went off and killed themselves. And I've, I've often thought that, that here is the thing. Uh, where did the demons go after the swine went into the water and killed themselves? Where did the demons go? Well, they had to go into the abyss. They had to go into the unknown. There's a strange thing about this idea that the demons want to be in something. The demons want to, be, to inhabit something rather than to be uninhabiting anything. And I don't understand all there is about it. It's a great mystery. But I do know this. Jesus had power over them. And when Jesus was through with the maniac of Gadara, he was like we want to see Baptists be. Sitting and clothed and in his right mind. And I'm looking at people just like that right here. You're sitting and you're clothed and you're in your right mind. That makes me happy. Uh, maybe maybe uh, God is doing a work in your life. Amen. But what I'm talking about, though, is it's very real. Uh, and so we don't want to minimize the reality of it uh, because some people go overboard on this thing. Remember, the worst and most deceitful of Satan's wiles is when he dresses them up in harmless looking packages. I think if, if, if there is a hierarchy of demon uh, kind, uh, the low class demons, the, the, the nitwit demons, the demons who aren't so smart, they would be the ones that you see. But when our government wants to get a spy to go somewhere and do some work, they, they, they find a very intelligent person, a multilingual person, a person who's gifted to act, a person who will go over there and spy. And no one knows they're a spy. No one guesses. They fit right in. They look right. And, and the Bible says that don't marvel if Satan's ministers appear as ministers of light. Don't be surprised that if somebody stands behind a pulpit and holds a Bible and talks for God, don't be surprised if behind him is really a demon uh, and that is the one energizing his life. And it doesn't take long before you can see it. Sometimes it's visible right away. Sometimes it takes a while to see it. But listen, there are people who are preaching the word of God today falsely who are demon led rather than spirit led. And this is the most deceitful of what Satan does today is in the area of false religion. Listen, which poison is more dangerous? Which poison is more dangerous? One that is on a shelf and it has a skull and crossbones on it and underneath it says poison. Or one that is in a bottle that looks like maybe some ketchup or some mustard or some condiment. And it's in there, and it's not marked, and it's where the food is. Well, easily, the one that's more dangerous is the one that's under disguise. The poison that will more, more likely kill you is the one that seems to be harmless, that seems even to be healthy. Listen, 
when Satan comes to this world as the Antichrist, he's not going to have a big sign that he holds up and he says, here I am, Satan, and I'm here now. He's not going to have a hat that says, go Satan on it, or hail King Satan. You know what he's going to come in here and do? He's going to appear to be a great, holy, religious leader who finally has the ideas that will help this world along. He's going to look and act and talk like maybe he's even Jesus come back. And that's what some people will think. Listen, that's how Satan does. He deceives. And it takes the Holy Spirit of God to give us the ability to perceive what's wrong. To have the gift of discernment. I've often been perplexed that some Christians seem to have a lack of discernment when it comes to things that are spiritual. But let me, let me just help you out a little bit. If you're listening to some guy speak, or if you're reading something somebody has written, and, it, and something just doesn't seem right about it, and you can't put your finger on it, you think, there's just something about it, I just don't know. That may be that little spark of discernment that the Holy Spirit is giving you. Check it out. Check it out. Read it and against Scripture. Go to someone who understands the Word of God and let him look at it too and find out. Because listen, there is a lot of things going on out there that aren't right, that, that, that the devil has put. Jesus told us up front that we're going to have tribulation. He told us that we're going to have troubles. Now, he told us this also. Be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Now, it looks like we're on the downside now, but that's now. One day we're going to be on the upside. We're going to be the winners. And listen, if you're following the Lord now and you're fighting in His name and you're in, involved in these struggles, listen, you're already on the winning team. We've been all worked up about an election. Do you realize how insignificant this one nation's election, this one thing is in the overall scope of eternity? When you put it in its perspective, let the heathen rage. Let them say what they'll say. Let them do what they'll do. King Jesus is going to reign. He's going to rule. He's going to come down. And it won't be because of an election. It'll be when he comes down and says, here I am. This is the kingdom. And listen, we won't have to wonder who he is because he'll have the nail scars still in his hands and he'll have crowns on his head and a name written that no man knows. And he's going to take over with a rod of iron and for once this world is going to be run right. Hallelujah for that. I'm looking for King Jesus. And listen, these people who are looking for the kingdom to come without the king, how's that going to come? Are you going to do it? No, we, we've had enough time to prove that we're not able to bring in the kingdom. Jesus is bringing the kingdom with him when he comes. He'll be sitting on the throne. Are you engaged in the struggle? Are you AWOL? Are you sitting on the couch with your feet up, spiritually speaking, letting others do all the work and all the fight? Are you contributing? Are you speaking the truth? Are you taking a stand? Maybe you're not on the front line, and maybe God hasn't called you to be on the front line, but He has called you to pray. He has called you to strive. He has called you to watch your own heart and watch your own soul. And listen, even if it has to do with saying amen, or even if it has to do with putting something in the plate, even if it has to do with uh, supporting those who are on the front line, that's important. The Apostle Paul often used military terms to describe the Christian ministry and the Christian work. When it came time for him to die, he wrote something to his son in the faith, Timothy, in 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, he's nearing the end of his life. He's anticipating uh, that he would be executed by Nero. And in 2 Timothy 4 verse 6, For I am ready, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. Now, he told Timothy to fight the good fight. He said, I have. I have fought the good fight. We don't read anywhere where the Apostle Paul balled up his fist and hit anyone. We don't read anywhere where he drew a sword. We don't read anywhere where he used any physical means. But we do know that rods were used against him, that whips were used against him. We do know that finally a headsman's axe was used, was used against him. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Now you know what the Apostle Paul is saying? I'm going to get my crown, and you can have a crown too. You can have a crown too. The kind of crown that Paul was going to receive, you can have that kind of crown too. That is a reward in heaven for what? For loving, for choosing, for siding with His appearing. You see, everything the Apostle Paul did was working for the kingdom of Christ, to gather adherents, to gather citizens for Jesus Christ. And we are taking citizens out of this world to make them citizens for the world to come. We don't need to spend too much mental energy and grief over worrying about the rotten corpse that this world has become. We are in a rescue business. We are in a salvation business. Yes, let me tell you how it's going to happen. America is going to go plumb to hell. It's a foregone conclusion, as are all nations of the world. This is not heaven. It was never intended to be heaven, and it's never going to be heaven. This is only part of the world system that is no more a friend to Christ and His kingdom than any other place in the world. And it's only manifesting itself now. Let me ask you this. Here's the question. Which side are you on? Which side do you choose to be on? Because you get to choose. You may not have chosen which side you're on now, That was chosen for you by birth, by nature of the fall. You're born into this world. But through the new birth, you can be born again through Jesus Christ and become a citizen of heaven, bound for glory, bound for eternity, and it gives you a new purpose for life. Dear Father, I pray that you'd help us to fight the good fight. Lord, to fight it where it's close to home. To fight it over Uh, the distances to foreign lands by missionaries and and, and being faithful to send to all nations of of the earth so that they can hear the salvation story through Christ. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to fight the flesh, to fight the world, to fight the devil. Lord, to not give in to the things of this world. To understand, Lord, that we are siding with you. And in doing so, because they hated you, they will hate us too. Because we chose you, they will reject us. Lord, I pray that you give us strength to be faithful. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand and let's sing again unto the name of the Lord.